Now we can advance our theory of the PN junction a little bit farther and develop a model for the current passing through a PN junction. I'm calling it the forward bias PN junction, but the same applies to reverse bias junctions. You will notice that nowhere will we make an assumption about whether the junction is forward biased, that is the high voltage on the P side, or reverse biased. There are four steps to doing this, and they are worked through in Calvin Hu's book in sections 4.6 through 4.9, and this lecture is really meant to be a companion to that, which I encourage you to read very carefully. There are four steps. The first step is to find the excess minority carrier concentrations at the depletion edges. Okay, that, that's a mouthful, but I think a picture will help to explain what that means. So on the P side, the minority carriers are the electrons, and on the N side, the minority carriers are the holes. Right now, we're, we're going to find a way to express the minority carrier concentrations right at the depletion edges. You remember X sub N and X sub P locate the depletion edges. N sub P0 means the electron concentration on the P side far away from, from the junction in thermal equilibrium. That is, using the expression that N sub I equals the square root of NP piece of N0 is also the hole concentration far away from the junction, uh, so in, in thermal equilibrium. P at X of N then is the hole concentration at X of N. What's the difference between these two uh, hole concentrations? The excess hole concentration. And the same here. This difference is the excess electron concentration in these kind of qualitatively drawn sketches. So let's write that down as an expression. Uh, electron concentration is its equilibrium value plus the excess carrier concentration. And we're talking about electrons as minority carriers on the P side. And we can do the exact same on the N side for the whole carriers. In section 4.6.1, this is derived. It's one equation. Well, it's a progression of expressions. Follow this derivation, equation 4.6.1. Um, which gets you to the point where you have an expression for the electron and hole carrier concentrations at the depletion edges. And it's a function of the, the, the voltage. Because if you don't apply any voltage, then at the, the depletion zone edge, carrier concentrations are just uh, thermal equilibrium values, <laughs> which is what these, uh, these uh, zero coefficients are. So you, if you haven't done it yet, pause the video and follow the derivation in equation 4.6.1. And so with these expressions, put them back up in here and have expressions for the excess carrier concentration at the, at the depletion edge as n prime of x sub p. You know, up here in this expression here, I, I should have probably put an of x on the n prime as well, because that's what's got position dependence. n sub p zero is just a equilibrium value, so it's a constant. N prime is where the X dependence is that gives N of X a, a X dependence. It's reflected a little more explicitly here. So N prime at the depletion zone edge of X sub P is N at the depletion zone edge minus the equilibrium value. It's this step plate here. Let's use our, our expression that we get from equation 4.6.1, which you have now finished pausing the video to study and, and are, are com comfortable with. Let, we'll replace n of x sub p with that, and p of x sub n with this. And we have the, these expressions that have voltage in them. Those are literally boundary conditions. That is, they are specified known quantities for the carrier concentrations at specific places, those specific places being the depletion uh, edges. But they're going to function as, as uh, boundary conditions in a few minutes. But when do you use boundary conditions? To solve differential equations. And so that's what we'll do with it. So in step two, let's use the continuity equation, which also is derived in your, your reading. So we'll use the continuity equation to literally write down differential equations for the excess carrier concentrations. It, when I say in the neutral N and P regions, what I mean is outside of the depletion region. So the excess hole concentration outside the depletion region on the N side and the excess electron concentration 
outside the depletion region on the P side. We were talking about minorities. So there's this uh, expression that was derived in section 4.7. This is the continuity equation, which is, is found all over physical sciences. It's used in, sure, semiconductor uh, electronics, semiconductor physics. It's used in fluid mechanics. It's uh, used in thermodynamics. It's a very important equation, which basically says what goes in must come out. The derivations in section 4.7, I'm simply going to talk you through the expression itself. So you have the excess hole concentration, and then there's a version also for excess electron concentration. You just switch out the P's and N's. And that equals you have this diffusion coefficient, remember, and the recombination time. Recombination time is tau. And so you have, have this product here, which you know together is actually the diffusion length squared. But that's constant stuff. This is property of material times the second derivative of the whole concentration with position. That's the continuity equation. And later in this chapter, we're going to have another term added on to the, to the end here, having to do with optoelectronics. It's the, the photon generation rate. So if you hit the semiconductor with photons, you will generate carriers at a given rate and they will live for a given amount of time and so we're going to add this term later in chapter four but for now you can take this to be zero so I'll just cross it out and ignore it a uh, similar version like i said exists for electrons as well as minority carriers and so we have these two continuity equations ignore the tau g and uh, you might feel compelled to replace the Diffusion coefficient times your combination time, that product, with a single L squared. That L is the diffusion length. The diffusion length on the N side is L sub N. The diffusion length on the P side is L sub P, where you would also swap out a subscript P for the diffusion coefficient. In fact, we're going to do that in step three, which is to apply those boundary conditions from step one and solve for n prime and p prime in the neutral regions and again the neutral regions means beyond the depletion uh, region out outside of the depletion region before i make it appear here look at the differential equation and ask yourself what does the solution look like we have a function n prime which equals its own second derivative what does that look like that's an exponential right and it could be plus or minus it could be e uh, plus x or e to the minus x with a constant up there uh, you have to decide which one of those to keep. One, only one makes sense. For example, if x is positive, you wouldn't keep the e to the plus x term because it blows up at large x. Write out the expressions then. So what you need to do right now is probably just pause the video again and convince yourself that this equation, remember, we're ignoring tau g, that these two equations have these two solutions. Or again, I've made this, this substitution that l sub p squared is d sub p times tau. And, and prime and p prime are exponentials, and I kept different terms, the, the positive term for the n because uh, it's on the uh, left side in negative x territory, and I kept the, either the minus x term for p because it's on the right side in positive x territory. I don't want these exponentials blowing up at large x. Apply the boundary conditions. Well, the boundary conditions, it says that at x equals x of p, you know what n prime is. It's n prime of x of p. So how does that influence the way you write the solution? Well, at x equals x of p, you can go ahead and write your exponential so that it equals 1, and it does, right? So that's why it's x minus x of p. And then the coefficient is the thing you know, n prime of x of p. It's just common sense that resulted in this format for the expressions, applying the condition, known condition at the boundary. There, now we have ex expressions for the, the position dependence of the excess charge carrier. I'm really mostly interested in what these excess carriers are at the depletion edge so that I can uh, come up with a, a conductivity. Oh, and by the way, just as an aside, you also know the majority carrier concentrations. Those are actually kind of trivial. They are simply the doping levels, assuming 100% ionization. And as we went through before, the excess majority carrier concentration is negligible compared to the majority concentration that's already there. So we just say that on the N side, the majority carriers are electrons and their concentration is the doping level.
All right, so let's go to step four, which uses those expressions now for p prime and n prime as a function of x to find the minority carrier current. Okay. Uh, which, by the way, it's entirely by diffusion. I, I'm not going to work through that proof either because it's done for you. It is stated, actually, it's stated in your book. And then you are referred to Appendix 3 for a quantitative computational example that illustrates just how true that is. And so read to Appendix 3 for the purpose of seeing that the drift current is negligible, that is the current due to the voltage of minority carriers, and the diffusion current is all that really matters for, for minority carriers. So let's uh, set up our semiconductor again, and we have our, our um, positive and uh, negative electrodes attached to the P and the N type. And I depicted currents. So J sub NP is the current of electrons in the P side. Now electrons want to go towards a positive voltage. And so they are. They're heading towards the positive voltage, which means their current is going to the right in the opposite direction. And then same for holes. You know, holes want to go towards the negative voltage, so their current is going to the left in the opposite direction. Because carrier current goes in the opposite direction. It's curious. You might write the the charge densities like this. You just add them to add them together, right? And and knowing that they can they could cancel. You could end up with a um, no no carrier current. Took the the expression for diffusion current. That's diffusion current. Remember we have a different expression for drift, Q and V, but it's just diffusion current. Just add it together for the holes on the the N side and the electrons on the P side. And I'm going to evaluate them at the uh, depletion edge. Because remember, the, the carrier concentrations vary with position, but I'm going to take the derivatives, evaluate at the depletion edge, which then means I know the current densities at the depletion edge. And so I just, because I, I just need to know the current density someplace. Because whatever the current density is here, it is here, it is here. It can't be different. The current density cannot be different in different places, right? It has to be the same all the way throughout. I need to differentiate something, so here's our expression for uh, the excess carrier concentration that we'll take the derivative of and then evaluate. But you know, so it's, it's not too terribly practical with these coefficients, but we also have expressions for these uh, care excess concentrations at the depletion edge written in terms of this voltage. Now that's extremely practical. Use that, right? The n prime at the x of p is this, this exponential of qv over t minus 1. So use that and and uh, go ahead and take the derivative of these expressions. It's really just the derivative of these exponentials and insert them in here. Let's do that. I did that. Uh, pause the video and do it yourself. And put them in there. Uh, do a little housekeeping on this. Let's bring the exponential minus 1 term outside. And now we've got uh, uh, this thing in front of the exponential minus 1, this thing which is all constants, uh, we'll just give it a name. We'll call it j sub 0. The current density is the, this coefficient j sub 0 times what's in the exponential minus 1. So there's an expression for the current density going through a semiconductor. Now, current density and current are simply related by the cross-sectional area of the semiconductor that this current's flowing through, right? So uh, current is current density times area. So if you can say this about current density, you can say this about current. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll call current I sub zero times this exponential. Now this should look rather familiar to you. It was a homework problem in our first week of the semester. And if you've ever studied electronics before, you've uh, um, seen the, the, the Shockley diode equation, uh, which we can make a sketch of. Just a qualitative sketch of what that equation looks like. Um, it's a very distorted sketch, but it's kind of what it looks like. And it helps you to understand what this I sub zero in front is really telling you. If you make a sketch and you go into negative voltage, uh, what you realize is, okay, e to the minus qv or kt is e to the negative something, and that something is getting bigger and bigger, which means that this exponential is going to zero fast. And it goes to zero pretty quickly, and it just levels off. And so I sub zero is the value of I when you are reverse biased, when voltage is negative. And so you call it the reverse bias current. It's a current you have, and it's a constant. So if you increase the voltage on the, the semiconductor, you don't change the current at all. It's a useful thing in other ways. Uh, 
think about this. You can't um, keep increasing the voltage forever. You know, you can't get to like a billion volts. The semiconductor won't tolerate, right? Eventually, you get to a point where the voltage is high enough that you have a breakdown, junction breakdown. And when that happens, you, you have this avalanche of impact ionizations, that is the electrons that are getting more, have being more and more accelerated as they have more and more electric field to accelerate in, eventually collide with such high energy that they uh, ionize the atoms and create more electrons, and that's an avalanche effect. And it kind of looks like this. So you have this... Um, same exponential on the positive side, but eventually it breaks down. Uh, so it's called reverse bias breakdown. A Zener diode is a diode that's designed to pretty much always operate in breakdown when it's reverse bias. And, and you don't damage it by, by becoming reverse bias. You don't necessarily damage any diode by reverse biasing it unless the current is so high, which is going to be the case for a lot of diodes, that you, you fry it. Um, but the Zener diode is, is designed to, to go into a reverse bias breakdown and not fry. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's used then, useful then as, as like a, it's especially useful for protection circuits. I used to put them on the inputs to the, to a amplifier bias circuits. Um, you, you put it across the, the, the terminals and if you happen to get a, uh, very high voltage, the junction breaks down. Uh, and you can, uh, because it's, it's reverse biased by a lot, and the junction breaks down and you um, um, protect your uh, uh, protect your asset, <laughs> protect the circuit. We'll stop it with that. That's, that's junctions uh, with reverse bias current and forward bias current. And um, we're about ready, after one more example here, we're about ready to start optoelectronics next.